everyone. Jeremy Slate here, and uh, welcome back to a new episode of the Command Your Brand Show. Um, if you are new to this channel, we uh, really try to take impacting things about your future and make you better informed. And AI is something that is either going to be the death of us or the growth of us. And I actually think we're heading to a really bright future for those that learn how to harness it correctly. Um, for those of you that are new to me, I'm the CEO of Command Your Brand. We are a new media PR company and also podcast production agency. And the guest we have with us today is somebody I've known for, gosh, I think seven or eight years now. I've known him for quite a long time, and he's been doing a lot of our marketing the last couple of years, including building our new website. He's the CEO of Growth Driven Digital. Um, his name is Avi Vatsa. And before I welcome Avi to the show, I want to remind you, if you're new to this channel, hit the subscribe button below, hit the notification bell so you don't miss any new episodes, and share with your family and friends because that does help us make a bigger impact. So without further ado, Avi, welcome back to the show, man. It's a pleasure to be back. Thank you for having me here. Absolutely, man. So for people that may not be familiar with you, may not know your story, just tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do, man. Absolutely. My name is Avi Vatsa, and I'm the CEO and founder of Growth Driven Digital. It's a performance marketing and AI marketing agency now. And like the name says, it's growth driven. So everything that we do is to drive growth across all channels um, for our clients. So we've generated over $30 million in online sales for our clients, over a million leads for our clients. So uh, everything that we do is to drive growth for all of you and our clients. Absolutely. And I, I want to focus on AI today because I think it's the, the thing that's interesting about it. So you and I were together, I don't know, like what, five months ago now um, in Thailand, we were at the Ad Fest conference, which was a great conference. And they had somebody there from Google there presenting on Google's new AI, which since that point hadn't launched. Now it has launched. We've had some experience with it. But the thing that seems interesting to me is, yes, everyone was talking about AI. We were starting to see its use a little bit. But if you look at its development and what it actually does and just the pure number of apps and systems that exist, it seems like we've kind of 10x, 100x or 1000x since that time period. So I'd love to hear a little bit about from your viewpoint of kind of where we are in that, that growth point of AI. Right. So uh, the way it's going and the history, is look, it's really a going, it's getting better and better with a crazy amount of speed. And there's more and more uh, businesses coming up as AI businesses, uh, which actually work. For the last couple of years, there were still AI businesses powered by AI, but they were not working as well as they should have. Even ChatGPT six months ago or eight months ago, like in the beginning of this year, uh, it wasn't always accurate. It wasn't always giving the right answers. You know, it was good, but it's significantly better now. It's not, the, it's not perfect yet, but it's at least a hundred times better in terms of its mm -hmm. answers, right? And it's not just chat GPT. It's like, I have a list of 497 other AI websites wow. that are equally better that automate your video production, that automate your sound production, that automate and help you with creatives, you know? And for us, it used to take us 15 to 20 days to write a sales funnel copy or an email marketing campaign, like at least a week. Now it's minutes, you know, mm. even with the editing after chat GPT, it's minutes. So we're able to take on, we took on like as many clients as we did in the entire year before chat GPT, right? Because we could take them, we could deliver to them. So that's obviously increased our production and that's going to happen across every profession in the beginning where chat GPT and AI will help them improve their service and the quantity and volume of their service. But eventually it's like, there's no way out of it. It, it will replace people for sure. Mm -hmm. Like, It's interesting you mentioned that too, because I know for us, so when we started this company back in 2015, we had a different name, but the thing we actually started with was podcast production. Mm -hmm. And that service we've started offering again now in the last couple of weeks because people demanded it. But the main issue is, is because costs have come down 70 or 80 percent of where they were for us, right? It was a very, very expensive service for us to deliver. And to be able to deliver it to the masses, it was just not possible. So now everything we're doing is actually driven by AI. And I guess the thing I want to I start with on that is how do you think that affects jobs and careers in different markets and different, you know, different ideas like copywriting and things like that? How do you think that AI is going to affect you know, different positions like that? I mean, like, for for example, you know, there's a progression from like hard labor effort 
like physical activity jobs. And then, you know, it became more and more skilled and more and more skilled. And then there's still a bunch of routine jobs like accounting, bookkeeping, um, HR, where, you know, there's repetitive work and there's a lot of paperwork, legal, all of that. Like, for example, accounting, um, it's going to become completely AI driven. There are already companies, the one I showed you yesterday, they're offering yeah. bots to you. Like there's a bot that I've just started running. It's, an, it's a robot that's connected to ChatGPT that goes through my ideal clients, Google profiles and Facebook profiles, finds their contact information, emails them, writes the email, Chat wow. automatically while I'm sleeping. So it's an it's a completely automated cold email outreach campaign that runs 24-7 through Chat GPT. So think about this, right? It's uh, it, that's one thing, but I could automate my bookkeeping completely from like I just need to tell Chat GPT what invoice, whenever I make a new invoice, it's automatically going to do its bookkeeping. You know, there's mm -hmm. so many things that are in the future going to get automated. So A, it's going to significantly cut down costs and B, it will take out jobs. It's going to replace people but unless they start thinking and start becoming creative where they can handle chat GPT because chat GPT mm -hmm. still relies on an input and the, and, and the skill to be developed is how to give the right input so that it can actually do its job. And then, find a uh, quality check it. So I'm, I heard Peter Diamandis talking about this um, this morning, actually, that he believes that, and it, it was on uh, London Real, he was talking to Brian Rose, and he was saying that he thinks this is actually the, the next big opportunity for companies to grow and make revenue and things like that and scale. I'm curious from your viewpoint, how do you see companies reacting to this? Because we're, we're talking about here, like, jobs and careers are going to change, right? So it's, um, you know, certain industries may disappear totally where others may grow because they're changing. So how do you think businesses react to this? And how do you think, um, you know, business processes react to this? Right. So businesses are going to benefit from this tremendously in terms of like our businesses as well, cost savings, a uh, higher production, a higher volume of delivery and operations, faster delivery and operations. So businesses are going to, um, definitely it's an opportunity. And historically, it's also proven that whenever such a big disruption happens and a change of operation, operating basis happens like this, yes, it feels painful in the beginning and some people uh, do lose jobs, but eventually you know, new jobs are created for them, right? Mm -hmm. So that's also going to happen with this. But um, chat, not chat GPT, but AI in general, I think will end up becoming sentient, uh, as close to sentient as possible. Uh, and are we talking Skynet or, or where are we going with this, Avi? Come on, man. Don't, don't scare the hell out of me here. It's, it's a logical <laughs> progression. You can't really stop it. Like chat GPT has already put so many restrictions on its AI. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. you cannot use certain words. You cannot write funny jokes about, uh, uh, public figures. You cannot, you know, you know, there's a lot of restrictions on chat GPT. But that's just chat GPT. I had it write a movie script for me the other, other day. So I said, I, I said, uh, Donald Trump is Iron Man. So now write a movie script for me as if he was Iron Man and give him a cool superhero name. So it made this whole movie script about the last American Avenger. <laughs> that's so that's huge. a public figure and it let me, man. So I don't know. Yeah, I mean, no. So that was just a movie script, which was pro him. But if you like, I asked it to write. Uh, a comeback to some politician, I'm not going to name who, they said sure. something really stupid and I wanted to write a comeback about that, uh, you know, just as a joke and it wouldn't let me. I do, I That's wanted... really interesting. So who? So is it the AI that does that or is that the, just the data it's, it's driven by the developers or where does that come from? No, so if you look at the terms uh, and, uh, of ChatGPT, OpenAI, is very specific on what restrictions they've put in and they'll keep mm. adding them. like you know someone could literally ask an ai to write like create a bomb or give it instructions an sop on how to like start the next world war so we want to 
so open ai is very uh you know aware of this so they put restrictions mm -hmm. on that you know got it right so for business owners looking at this um there's a lot of different ways you know, you could you could consider this, right? You could bury your head in the sand, which I think is kind of the worst decision. You could figure out how to strengthen processes you already have, um, or you know, there's many other ways you could respond to this. But for business owners that are hearing this and maybe they haven't done a ton with AI or they're new with this, what what advice would you give them when considering how this can work in their company? So it's really you got to research get some courses or get some templates uh, or just start playing around with it but your output and the quality of your output on chat gpt or any ai program for that matter will depend on the instructions and the quality of your instructions that you give it right mm. so the first thing is there's stuff that you can't even dream that it could do for you so, you know, get some ideas. There's lots of templates. There's, um, I, I'm just going to put it out there. There's actually a company called Tri, like Sintra, Sintra, S-I-N-T-R-A. And I love mm -hmm. it. So like literally from HR, how to make a, a team, um, employee handbooks, uh, team policies, all the HR work. It's all automated in Sintra. They have very specific prompts. You just copy paste it. It gets done. And for marketing, every single thing from competitor research. If you're using Chat GPT four, it's the most updated version, and it has Chrome plugins where you can mm -hmm. it's full data. Chat GPT three had data only till 2021, so anything after 2021, it wasn't aware of. Right. So with mm -hmm. Chat GPT four and GPT five, as it comes out. You can make it do competitor research, market research, branding, voicing. I think you did the voice as well, right? Like you can just- we, find... Yeah, we actually used it to um, put out our brand standards. And that was a fun experience. Um, I think, do you know Ed Dearborn by any chance? Of course, yeah. Okay, yeah. So Ed actually gave me a lot of feedback on like how to use it to, to do different iterations of things. And we actually, um, in about a day and a half, turned out a 64 page brand standards manual that I was like, this is my brand to a T um, from brand voice to brand u verb usages to um, the thing we had to do differently. And I'm sure there's an AI out there. I just didn't know it existed, but I had to do like visual branding. I had to do myself, right? Like, you know, what are our color patches and what are uh, logo usages and backgrounds and stuff like that. But for the most part, anything written and, you know, some of them were more iterate, more iterations and more kind of working through until I got what I wanted. But it was I, I was like impressed when I was able to see what I did with putting together a brand standards manual just using GPT three, not even GPT four. Right. Exactly. Right. And I did the same employee handbook, company policies, brand standards, SOPs, a bunch of stuff. It, you, I still used to do it before, but it used to take me hours and days. Mm -hmm. and this is like it's just speeding it up. Right. Well, yeah, and what I find too, because we use it a lot for like uh, like meta descriptions for blog posts and blog titles and stuff like that, and it's just the number of like variables it can look at, right? Whereas I can like I can think about a title maybe one or two ways. It's looking at hundreds of thousands or millions of different variables to create a title, right? So it just is able to crunch more data than a human can crunch. Absolutely, and uh, crunch more data. But right now, its data was limited. Well, now. Like what, what, what would you say, Jeremy, how would this affect your life? Like you're recording this podcast and while mm -hmm. you're recording it in real time, it's going to be editing it automatically. It's going to edit your video. It's going to write the captions, descriptions, everything and post it for you while you're, you're doing something else. You don't have to do mm -hmm. anything right now. You have to put a prompt in chat GPT to do it. Right. But what mm -hmm. if you just did that once, you put that prompt once and give it the standing instructions and it would do it automatically and even go as far as posting it for you. Mm -hmm. And that's not the next step. It's already happened. So the thing that concerns me about that, like it, it's one, one hand, it's more opportunity, right? But on the other hand, couldn't there just be larger companies centralizing more because they're getting all these tools and they actually have the money to afford them, whereas other companies can only do so much? How do you mean? So like, let's say, for example, uh, a company like Microsoft, you know, 
they're huge, right? Their budget is going to be way bigger than mine and yours combined and probably 10, other com- 10 20 other companies we could bring oh, in there. Yeah. So their ability to hire prompt engineers or people to run AI, but also not even to just run AI, also develop their own internal AI is going to be better than you know me, you, or mom and pop out there. So is that going to just kind of centralize a lot of these services then? Because if they can outcompete us because they have the dollars now, or do you think this kind of democratizes it more because it brings a lot of the process to you know individual smaller companies? Yeah, so AI has been there, right? Like uh, Google's been using it for dec- like almost a decade, right? Mm. But its own AI algorithms. It's all been AI, you know. And there's that there was there's still a phase going where people are saying it's an AI company when it's not even AI. It's just an algorithm, right? Yeah. Uh, I think right. that's a really important distinction, too, because I think a lot of people have taken algorithms, machine learning, and AI and tried to make them all AI. Yeah. I mean, half of the companies that we say it's AI is not actually AI, right? Mm-hmm. So AI has been there and it's been leveraged by the big companies for at least a decade. Like, this is the third phase, you know, when there's these three different phases where, like, when new technology is developed, only a few a clique, a certain group has it, then they use it for their own benefit, then it goes down mm-hmm. to a few more uh, adopters, and then it becomes general population, right? Mm-hmm. And chat GPT is, I think, the general population version of it. I think AI has mm-hmm. been in development for at least since the 80s. Wow. So that's really interesting then. So I think that's super interesting because the thing... I don't want to sound like an idiot here, but the thing the thing that I, I wasn't considering that, um, that, you know, these companies have been doing these things for a long time and they're just kind of rolling it out to the general public now. So I guess that they're not really going to, like the number of permutations they're running isn't going to change that drastically versus what they've already been doing. But what this actually does is more of a democratization. It is more to the individual company and brand. 100% chat GPT open AI was a nonprofit in the beginning and that was their purpose, but now it's for profit, but the mm. purpose is still there, right? It, this is a democratization of this. It's the mass distribution of AI. Uh, but how do you think Elon Musk was sending his rockets or how do you think even in the eighties, how do you send rockets that have to do everything by themselves up in space without AI? Cause Elon just has a bigger brain than us. I don't know. <laughs> He's Elon. It's it's a version of AI. This is just a linguistic version of AI, chat GPT, right? But there's other versions of AI in defense technology, missiles. It's already been there. And it's now just gets better and better and better. And the eventuality of it is what we've seen. Um, You know what happened with the the facial recognition AI stuff, right? With the, Mm -hmm. the Hollywood protests. Are you aware of that? Recently. Yeah, and that was one of the big things with um, the writer strike and and things like that is they they want to start using more. I think it was a licensing thing, right, where they can take your data and they can use it to make an AI rather than having to actually hire you again. Is that what yeah, it was? It was a data thing. Yeah, no, it was basically um, if you're an extra, like you know those people in the background, so mm-hmm. they'd pay them for one day to come into the studio, get their image scanned. And then the AI would replicate them in the entire movie. So they'd only get paid for one day's work uh, because they just have to come in for that one day to get them scanned. Wow. And they'd sign over their license to use them, their face, their body uh, uh, to the studio. So that's really, really interesting. Cause so um, uh, what's his name? Uh, he ran for president here in the U.S. Andrew. Um... It's a tech guy. Oh, not gosh, Andrew I can't remember. <laughs> no, not, definitely not Andrew Tate. Was it Andrew? It wasn't Andrew Chang. Um, Andrew Chang. No, what was his name? Anyway, um, but he was talking about, and I think this is interesting, he was kind of more for a universal basic income thing, which I'm not a big fan of, but he was saying that what he was actually looking at doing it from is the licensing fees of a lot of companies using our image and likeness and all of our data they're collecting online. And I I don't think we consider that like data, I think is actually one of the next big revolutions, right? Because yes, there's been to some point, there's been a, there's been a revolution in it, but I think it's actually who has our data, how they get it and what they do with it. To me, I think there's going to be another big, big leap there for companies. What what do you think? 100%. Um, 
Did you see that episode of um, Black Mirror? The new season of Andrew Black Yang Mirror. was the guy's name, by the way. Uh, um, Black Black Mirror. I think I've watched one episode. I I don't even have Netflix, so. Okay, fine, good. So, and uh, Black Mirror came out with a new season in 2023, and there was one episode where a couple of actors sign a license to Netflix to uh, use their entire data uh, to create a completely AI made movie, and that's literally what just happened in Hollywood. Because they have the tech to do it, right? Mm -hmm. You see. And in terms of data, it's like they already have your data. So, what, like, I, what was your question in exactly? So, my question. So, like, um, from the perspective of like you, these different companies are, you know, remarketing to you based on your data they've gotten from, you know, that's the, the way they've done it for years, right? But now they're getting more and more and more and more data based on these user agreements that people are opting into that they're not reading. So I'm actually curious if this takes us maybe to like a like a digital bill of rights or something like that. I'm curious if you see that come something coming down the road of like how our actual data is controlled and used. That needs to be done 100%. And I think that's a very right way to put it. Digital bill of rights. There has to be one, mm -hmm. right? Because that's what happened in Black Mirror. Like they didn't read the uh, the agreement and they just signed it and handed over their entire data to that to netflix you mm -hmm. see uh so there needs to be like you can't just fool us into signing something that we don't understand mm -hmm. that's not cool. i i think it's because at the same time like there's some should be like innovation is really important don't get me wrong but there also should be some sort of restrictions as well right because there should be careers for people and jobs for people and things like that and i think they will be and i think they'll be a little bit different but at the same time, we have to have guardrails there, if that makes sense. There has to be. Otherwise, it can blow up. Like, there's a lot of disadvantages to automating an entire society. I think there's a lot of uh, books and talks about it for at least a century now. And mm -hmm. uh, if we don't put guardrails, if we don't, like, that's what Elon Musk said, right? That's why he came out of this. There, there could be, and it, it will happen. Like, it just, there's no way out of it. But so that's why we need to, like, Make sure that there is guardrails. There are, you know, things that we can do to protect the society and mm -hmm. use it productively. From your perspective, what things do you think should be like a like a b digital bill of rights concern? Or what things should we be concerned about about consumers that we're not thinking of? Well, uh, identity theft can be extremely easy now with uh, deep fakes and everything like that. Um, you know, uh, also, how do you hand over the right to use your double or your voice or your uh, face to a company? Like you can't, it's just, even if there is a, uh, you know, possibility, it should be against the law. Like you can't just do that, you know, for whatever mm -hmm. reason. I mean, I don't know. Have you tried it? A lot of people have tried it um, where you create your virtual AI figure persona and then they talk in your ads and everything. I have not done that. That's a thing. Yeah. I mean, Manuel Suarez also doing it. Uh, Rudy. Oh, my Rudy, gosh. It's a, it's a thing. That's a thing. Wow. That's that's extreme, man. That kind of scares me because He's that would like because here's the thing, like. I don't even have to be a podcaster anymore. Like that's kind yep. of, do you get what I'm saying? Like that, I, I think what's actually going to happen then is there's going to be so much more value put on something that's actually human, right? Because so many things aren't anymore. Exactly. I, I, I don't know if you know about Descript. So like you, ha you just give it your voice. We were using that for like, um, for transcriptions, but I wasn't using it for much more than that. Yeah, it's, it's started like that, but you can like just give it your voice like you have with this other AI thing. And then just put any document in Descript and it will read it out as your voice, in your voice. Wow. So you can literally just type in stuff from ChatGPT, put it to Descript. It's going to make a podcast out of it. Like right now. It's there already. So what advances in AI are you most watching? Like what things to you as an agency owner, as a person running a marketing agency, like obviously there's things that you're going to prioritize in hierarchy for yourself. What things are you watching that are kind of most important to yourself in AI? 
So right now, um, we're going like into AI development. So we're basically, uh, I didn't know it was possible, but now I know that for a fact that I can easily do it. So chat GPT is just a language AI, right? And then mm -hmm. there's other video AI, sound AI, and other AIs. But now there's a way to run automatic bots to connect the AIs to do the work. Right now, the AI just writes or records or edits or does one specific thing. But the entire flow line is not automated from production, creation, editing, production, writing, posting, distribution. That's not automated yet. Mm -hmm. But it is now starting to be. That's the next mm. AI solution. So the entire flow line of production of content, production of marketing, as far as analyzing the Facebook ads data, seeing what's working and what creative isn't working, and then optimizing it is can be automated now by bots. Mm. Like Google Analytics, all that data goes into ChatGPT, ChatGPT analyzes that data, comes out with why it's not working, and writes copy to make it better, and then posts that copy on your blog or on your website. I should not wow. be saying that this is what I've started. Yeah, this is, it's already been done. Right? Yeah. Well, no, even because I know like one thing that we've been doing as well, and it's, you know, I'm obviously a little bit more rudimentary than you, but like, you know, things we've done is, is having it, we, you know, we write a blog post, we have it optimize it for SEO for us, and then we take a look at it again and make sure that it still sounds humanish, right? Like those things are important. But I think there is, there's a lot of, a lot of opportunity, I think, out there for brands that learn how to use it the right way. But I think there's certain things being human are still always going to matter. I'm curious your thoughts on that. 100%. Look, uh, there is an urge in humanity or in all life like to duplicate itself. Mm -hmm. And what whatever we make and whatever goes really well is just a duplication of the core abilities of life. For example, Facebook, all of social media just made one of our most fundamental abilities, which is communication, uh, be able to be faster, uh, easier, and global. So it, it, it overcame the barriers of space and time. I literally had to travel to America or write a post, an uh, email, or like, sorry, a post uh, and post it to you from another, from India to America mm -hmm. in order to communicate with you. That would take days for you to receive, days for me to get it back, right? Mm -hmm. And that would be words. And uh, social media and internet, it bridged that gap and made it faster and more instant, right? Uh, so I didn't have, and then it became not just words, it became images, then it became videos, and then it became, now it's gonna become 3D, where right now we're seeing each other on, on, on a 2D space, right? But then mm -hmm. with VR and AR, you're going to be sitting in front of me and we're going to be having this uh, conversation, even though you're in America and I'm not in America, I could be like 5,000 miles away, but we'll be sitting face to face and having that experience. So it's technology is just bridging the gap on uh, or enabling human beings to express themselves and do what they anyway do. Right. And that's mm -hmm. really, and even with AI, people love to automate things in their minds. You know, they, they, they'll do things as habits, right? And AI is just an automating of tasks, which becomes a habit, right, in the in the real world. So, but when it comes to the what human beings are best at in terms of creating, in terms of their imagination, in terms of their ability to think, decide, and, you know, do judgments and, and mm -hmm. create, that's never going to go away. And I think it's just the, all of this technology will just help it grow even more. Mm -hmm unless it's used specifically to suppress them and take away, the, take away their fundamental rights, you know? And it could easily happen, so it's a fine line. Well, I, I'm going to get a little bit terrified if somebody comes up to me in the next couple of weeks and asks me to pick a, a red pill or a blue pill, then I'm, then I'm going to be kind of feeling like I'm in trouble, man. <laughs> <laughs> because I, I like, it, it's very interesting because there, there's half of me that looks at it and says, this is exciting, I can see so much growth here. But then the other half that says to me, well, well, what about the people, right? And I think it's it's something that really, I think for all of us needs to be a considerate balance, right? Because 
if we're not figuring out how to how to use AI, if we're not figuring out how to do things more cost effective, businesses aren't going to exist. But exactly. at the same time, we want people to be able to exist too, right? So I think it's hard to like say, okay, we want to innovate, but we don't want to innovate too much. Um, I don't think that's true. I mean, like I said, um, every new technology brings about a disruption and a lack of jobs uh, in the old technology. But if we come up with um, better ways of educating people, better ways of training them faster, then I don't mm -hmm. think I'm always, I'm sure people will always have a job. That's how we got where we are by, we didn't like necessarily learn everything in school. We didn't learn about AI in school. We didn't learn about yeah. 90 of the things that we do in our life to make money and succeed in school. We mm -hmm. learned it because we had a thirst for knowledge and we learned it ourselves. Right. Mm -hmm. So people tomorrow, you know, graphic designing changes completely. It becomes automated 100 percent. There still will be a, a person who needs to create. And so if someone knows the basic principles of design, who, who can give the inputs to uh, AI, that person still will be there. Maybe mm -hmm. he can only do one design in one week, but now he'd be able to do a thousand or a hundred, mm -hmm. you know, but he'd still be there. And he'll have more time for his family and friends too. So there's a good way and a bad way, you know? I think education is actually one of the next things that is going to be disrupted, I think. Because if you look at it, the model that we went to school on and we were trained on and everything else, it's, it was meant for, you know, the Industrial Revolution. And if you right. look at it, that, that really isn't the society we have around us anymore. So I think areas of study that we have are going to change. How we study needs to change. And, and frankly, I think one of the number one things missing is the practicality of what we're studying, right? Like are people just getting theory and getting bombarded by theory that they don't know how to use and getting no practical? Exactly. 100% study is the main thing that will change. But I'm telling you, man, study is going to change completely with VR and AR. Uh, <laughs> I'm telling you, this little thing right here. Oh, is what is that? This is a VR headset. It's the meta. Oh man. So it's just words, right? Words are symbols of real things. And we've been using words to write and to talk and communicate our knowledge from one person to another person. But what if we didn't need to use so many words and we could actually show the actual thing that the word represents? So for example, a person is studying about a ship in a classroom. And he's reading all the words that describe the ship, like what's a mast, what's a engine room, what's a, you know, all of those things. And those are all words which relate to real objects on a ship, right? So if he doesn't understand the words, he's going to have trouble understanding what he needs to do when he goes on the ship. And it's not practical. Mm -hmm. But with this, he can still be in the classroom and be on a ship and see everything that the words are supposed to represent. And actually that's really to... interesting because that the, the thing that that opens up the door to is being able to do tasks that are dangerous and life threatening and things like that and get really good at them and not have to actually be doing them. Like like imagine a heart surgeon doing a thousand heart surgeries before they ever do a heart surgery. I feel using... like there would be a lot more people alive, right? <laughs> In that way. Yeah, it's been used for at least five years that I know of, but I think for at least 10 years for that specific reason, uh, for heart surgeons and for operations, they've been using VR for at least five years. And they've been mm -hmm. using VR to train uh, pilots for at least 20 years. Wow. You know? Yeah, so it's been there. Now it's going to mass distribution level to the general population, and it's going to get democratized. Well, Abby, this has been a great conversation, man. If you, you're on the cutting edge of this stuff, and that's why people need to be connected with you. So if they want to do that, if they want to find out more about what you guys are doing, how's going to be the best way for them to connect with you? Yeah, they can go to the website growthdrivendigital.com or write to me at avi at growthdrivendigital.com. Very cool. Avi Vatsa, thank you so much for coming on today, my friend. Thank you. This was really good, really passionate. Thanks for having me. Amazing to talk to you again. Have a good one. Absolutely. Absolutely.